RPGs are an interesting game genre. You got your jam-packed games like Dark Souls, Diablo, Fallout, Elder Scrolls. Nintendo's got Fire Emblem, Xenoblade, Pokemon, and Paper Mario. But then you got Atlas with their flagship series, Shin Megami Tensei. And god damn is it a good ass franchise. It rivals the likes of Pokemon in gameplay, not in popularity that a franchise everybody should play and experience. Now this video isn't just going to be SMT, but it's also going to be about Atlas as a whole, the things they've done and their actions throughout the years that makes them who they are today. So let's start from the beginning. In 1987, Atlas created a little small game known as Digital Double Story Megami Tensei, based on a novel of the same name. Bam, the game is praised for its revolutionary gameplay, music, and graphics. So they got a pretty good hit. So they bring up a follow-up in 1990, Megami Tensei 2. And goddamn, this is a big improvement over the first, straying away from the novel this time too. So they got two big hits at this point. So in 1992, two years of the Megami Tensei 2, Atlas comes out with Shin Megami Tensei. Now yes, Megami Tensei had come out earlier on the Phantom Con, but SMT1 is what put them on the spot. And it was a huge success with the demon collecting system, with the fusions, and their unique setting never seen in a JRPG before. With choices that affect the ending you get, it's pretty revolutionary and it was a massive hit. One year later, Majin Tensei Duology comes out as an answer to Nintendo's Fire Emblem, which had come out three years earlier, which combines aspects of SMT1 with some strategy gameplay on the grid. 1994, two years after the original, Atlas comes out with SMT2, and goddamn, just like Megami Tensei 2, it improves in the first game in every way imaginable. Later that same year, we got SMT if, while not being as good as SMT1 and 2, it was still a welcome addition to the series. That's a prequel that will be that one game that we will talk about later. Even though most fans dislike the game, I think it's alright. Until, until World of Sloth, uh, just, just stop playing the game at that point. Then, in 1995 and 96, we got Devil Summoner and Soul Hackers, a spin-off of SMT. And holy hell, these are some of the coolest spin-offs I've ever seen. You play as a detective and a demon summoner, going around the streets of Tokyo and in my city, killing demons and being a badass. Then, later that same year, we got Persona 1 and 2, Be Your True Mind where it's a more character-driven game than SMT, where you unleash your persona, your true self, with really good stories. In just 12 years, Atlas has made a name for themselves. But, as the certain space soldier said, I think we're just getting started. Now, if you were an Atlas fan in the 90s, you were gonna love the early to late 2000s. You got Persona 2, Eternal Punishment, finishing up the story of Innocent Sin. 2003, you got the classic SMT Nocturne, revolutionizing the turn-based genre with its turn press turn system and its amazing alignment system. 2004 and 2005, you got the criminally underrated Digital Devil Saga duology, keeping the press turn system of Nocturne with a more party member focused system to the likes of Persona, but with more customizable party members and better stories. 2006, you got Devil Summoner Rido, an action RPG with some of the SMT aspects and some new ones. Then, in 2006, you got Persona 3. While not being my cup of tea, many people liked it, with social aspects and an overarching story. Later, with its follow-up with Persona 4 in 2008. Then, in 2009, you got Strange Journey, a return to classic SMT, with its unique setting in Antarctica. Not a fan of Megaton? Fine, you got Edge and Odyssey, a first-person dungeon crawler with an emphasis on customizing your party. Then, you got Trauma Center, a surgery simulator, which is surprisingly fun and you should really play it. And then there's Demon Souls. You should play it, I don't have to say anything. There's some other games that I'm not mentioned, but if I did, we'd be here all day. So when it came to Atlas, there was something for everybody. 
but there was one big problem. Most of these games did not sell all too well, but with the time and money Atlas would put into these games, they would perform under in profits. So Atlas would just be throwing money into a fire. Coming into 2010, Atlas would merge with a company called Index Holding. And while fans were concerned about the company, Atlas says they weren't slowing down, we were going to keep pumping out games. Oh, that, that did not age well. Now, the 2010s weren't all bad. We did get the amazing ST4, Catherine, and Soul Hackers on 3DS. But 2013, Atlas kind of fucking died. And they became consumed by Index Corporation, while the American branch lived on somehow. But then, eventually, Index Corp went bankrupt. So, yeah, things aren't going too well. But then, Sega from the sky came out and bought Index Corp and revived Atlas from the dead. And then Index Corp was separated from Atlas months later. So yeah, Atlas is back from the dead. That means we'll get awesome games again, right? Right? No. Atlas announces SMT4 Apocalypse, a what if scenario to the game that is SMT4. And it's not very good. It tried to be more character driven, but it ended up just falling flat on his face and it did not feel like SMT. It felt more like a persona but things would get even worse. On September 15, 2016, and in April of 2017 in America, Persona 5 would come out. And it was a massive success, becoming the best-selling game in the series, and the best-selling game Atlas would have put out, selling about 3 million copies worldwide. Finally, after all these years, it finally paid up with Atlas's work. But Atlas was finally thriving. But at the same time, they wanted more. So they pumped out a shit ton of Persona 5 content. Like the awful Persona 5 dancing in Starlight, where 60% of the game yet to pay for DLC. At least with Persona 4, we had a wide variety of spin-offs with their own songs, but Persona 5 dancing came out way too early. Then Atlas just kept putting Joker in everything they could think of. Dude, look at that! He's in Sonic Forces, Catherine, Smash Brothers, Star Ocean and Anim Animus, Grand Blue Fantasy, Puzzle and Dragons, Identity Vi, Fantasy Star, Lord of a Million, Kia Tobo Kotabu Flat, Another Eden, Sword Art Online, Memory Defrag. Like, Jesus Christ, calm down with the crossovers. Like, at this point, just put Joker in fucking Fortnite. Like, come on, I want to see that happen. Like, Atlas, the money is right there. Call go to Epic Games right now. Then, in 2019, we got Persona 5 Royal, an enhanced version of Persona 5, the definitive way to experience the game. Which is cool and all, if you've never played vanilla. If you played vanilla, it really wasn't worth the $60 they were charging you for. And if you wanted to trade a new content, you would have to go through 90 hours of vanilla just to get to the new stuff, and why would you want to do that? And oh, it doesn't end there. Now, if you bought Royal, you would get all the DLC from the original Persona 5 for free. Awesome! I get all these cool costumes and personas that I couldn't access before. But then, Atlas decides to add paid DLC to Royal. What the fuck? This is SMT4's DLC cycle all over again. So if you want to fight Yu Narukami, you better pay up! Later in 2020, Persona 5 Scramble came out. And while being positively received, it's not as good as the original Persona 5. In my opinion, at least. 2017, Atlas announces Shin Megami Tensei 5, and holy shit, everyone is shit in their pants, like holy shit, we're getting SMT5, let's go! But that was only a teaser trailer, and that was three years ago, and we basically got nothing but silence for three years. Now there could be a variety of reasons for why this was happening, either the game didn't have a vision, it was in development hell, or they put the game on the side for Persona 5 milking. All hype had basically died at that point, but then on 2020, in the Nintendo Mini Direct, SMT5 got another trailer showing what the protagonist looks like and bringing back Lucifer's old design. And this trailer was pretty fucking good. And it's coming out in 2021? Let's go! And then after that, we got a trailer for SMT Nocturne HD. Nobody was expecting this, and it's getting voice acting too. How could they possibly fuck this up? Then I go.
you'll be surprised. Well, the PS4 version is alright, but the Switch version is just not good. It runs way too poorly, and it runs on 30 FPS as well. I'm pretty sure the Switch is capable of 60 FPS. Not only that, you have to pay $10 if you want to have Dante, for some reason. When he was free, he came with the game like 16 years ago, and it's $50. There isn't just enough content to make it worth that price tag. Like, you know what would have been cool? If they added new demons. If they added something similar to hard type. Like, that would have been great, but this only appeals to like, people who've never played the game before. Now, a cool feature they added is like being able to play the original 2003 version in English, but the problem is that it's only on the PC version, so PS4 and Switch players are kind of fucked at this point. And not, yeah, SP Nocturne has received some patches, like trying to fix the performance, which didn't work at all, and being able to fuse demons with their own skills that you can pick. But also, the PC version of Nocturne is locked at 30 FPS. A PC game in 2021 locked at 30 FPS. Why? Why? Like, come on. Even strikers on PC run at 60. So yes, Atlas has been declining, and at this point, they could fall, and they become somewhat greedy. They don't let go of Persona 5, they only make Persona content, and they feel like they have to put Joker in every video game ever. And the fact that they did nothing to promote SMT5 for 3 years straight, and Nocturne HD launched bare bones and runs like dog shit on Switch, just proves that they aren't the same company anymore. But maybe with SMT5, they can change our minds. What I'm saying is, please don't fuck up SMT5.